Hello, and welcome to the American Floral Endowment's three-part webinar series for Botrytis Research. Throughout this series, we will hear the latest findings from AFE's Thrips and Botrytis Research Fund. AFE is the national nonprofit organization that funds scientific research to identify and solve challenges within the floriculture industry. In 2021, AFE is celebrating 60 years of providing for the future of floral. In 2017, after listening to important industry feedback, AFE established a special research fund to aggressively address the control and management of thrips and botrytis. AFE's goal of reaching 1.5 million in pledges was met in 2019 with contributions from 24 industry leaders and organizations to support new and innovative research to address these challenges. With those funds, AFE has been able to support eight multi-year research projects to reduce losses and produce higher quality flowers and plants. The American Floral Endowment and all researchers would like to thank all of the organizations who have made contributions in support of this important initiative. Today's speaker is Dr. Jim Faust. Associate Professor of Floriculture Physiology at Clemson University. So today we're gonna to start out a bit with the biology of botrytis because it's important to understand the organism uh, in order to control it properly. Uh, we'll, we will review the symptoms um, that you can help you identify botrytis because uh, it can be confusing and, and discuss some scouting and management strategies today. And then in the part two and part three, we'll dive into more details in terms of managing fungicide resistance and, and using fungicides and, and other tools such as calcium to uh, manage botrytis in your greenhouse facilities. So it's important to realize that, you know, we, we are working with a few specific crops. Um, the main crop that we've done the most work on has been uh, rose. Um, and, and cutflower production, although the results are certainly applicable to potted uh, roses. Uh, we've also done some work on Gerbera, as well as uh, a good bit of work on Petunia. And so we have three different systems um, for plants, uh, bedding plants, uh, potted plants, uh, and cutflowers. And, um, but the majority of the slides I'll show you today are with rose. Um, but again, you can ask questions about other species if you, if, if you have questions about them, but the principles are, are pretty similar across species. Um, so the first point that I'd like to make today is, 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 to, is to review just the basic biology of how fungi grow. Um, and botrytis, and you know, every fungus is a little different. Botrytis, um, this is an example where we have a leaf cross section and you have a spore. The botrytis obviously is, has airborne spores those spores land on a plant surface and then a, a germination tube or a germ tube forms. Um, and, and, and so just like a seed germinates, a spore germinates, the germ tube uh, emerges from that spore and then it penetrates the plant tissue. And botrytis is a necrophyte, meaning that it kills the, the cells that it infects. So um, it produces mycelium uh, which are kind of like root or stem type structures. And, and they penetrate the, the cells, they extract the goodies from the cells and, and, and use them for uh, the purposes of supporting the, the growth of the fungus. And in the process, uh, leave necr a necrotic lesion as indicated here, as the mycelium has penetrated these cells, those cells die and turn brown. And as that, um, fungus continues to penetrate the plant tissue, you get larger and larger uh, necrotic spots. So what also happens is that the infection does not necessarily occur simultaneously with uh, the germination of the spore and that you can have a spore land on uh, plant tissue, the germ tube forms and the plant becomes, or the, the, the spore is attached to the plant, but does not necessarily um, infect the plant uh, entirely until the environmental conditions are better for the survival and growth of that fungus. 
So this is what we would term uh, as being a latent infection, whereas it, it is infected, but you, you, know, you would may not see any visible symptoms until that tissue is placed into an environment um, where the fungus really thrives. Um, so that's why we kind of I, um, um, show this as just a couple epidermal cells for you know, right being infected here. And then um, you know, the, the mycelium not growing until a little bit later. So this is a latent infection. Also, when we're talking about diseases, it's important to um, um, think of management in terms of this disease triangle in that you, you need all three of these features to occur simultaneously um, in order to really have um, a pathogen um, attack a plant. So you have one, you need, the pathogen has to be present, which is kind of obvious, but with Botrytis, uh, Botrytis, we would consider it to be ubiquitous and that you would, you'd be hard pressed to find any environment that doesn't have some Botrytis spores fl floating around. Um, so you, it's difficult to eliminate the pathogen, although we can certainly reduce the uh, number of spores that are floating around by reducing the, uh, or we call that reducing the inoculum, uh, how, much, how many spores are available to land on plant tissues to infect that tissue. And, and, we, and we'll talk about reducing the inoculum um, later in this talk. You need a susceptible host. And of course, many of our floriculture species are quite susceptible. Different tissues within the plant have different levels of susceptibility, which we'll talk in more detail about today. Um, and as is the case with all path, um, all diseases, uh, you will see varietal or cultivar differences amongst the, amongst uh, a population of, of varieties. So, you know, there are going to be varieties that are quite resistant um, and then some that are very sensitive. Um, so one of the options is trying to choose plants, varieties that are less susceptible, but that's, that can be difficult. Uh, popular varieties, we tend to decide to grow um, regardless of their sensitivity. Um, and, and so then we have to you know, deal with that issue. Um, but choosing varieties is an option. Then the third um, feature of this disease triangle is having a conducive environment. You have to have the environment that is appropriate for botrytis to grow. And, and this has historically been one of our best approaches uh, to manage botrytis is trying to uh, prevent the greenhouse environment that um, allows botrytis to grow so well. And then of course we have other things like fungicides and calcium that help to protect the plant when you, you know, have a situation where all three of these situations, the pathogen, the host, and the environment are all um, present and conducive for the fungal growth. And, and in a greenhouse environment, we typically have all three of these occurring. So we have to look at strategies to, to deal with botrytis despite this disease, all three sides of this disease triangle always being uh, present or frequently being present. So it's important that we identify botrytis properly if we're going to um, treat it. And, and we do see uh, growers that um, I'd say fairly frequently, we see growers that think they have botrytis. In fact, they don't, um, or they're, they're misdiagnosing botrytis. So these are the, the symptoms that we typically see on rose petals. Uh, we see um, beige um, colored lesions. So this will start as a spot and then it grows. So this would be from one spore. Um, sometimes these, uh, again, these, these, the infection occurs in the greenhouse but we don't see the symptoms until we've packaged those roses and, and shipped them. And so we put them in a much more humid environment. And then you start to see some deterioration of uh, petals in the post-harvest environment. And then of course the symptom that's very easy to identify is the common name of, of gray mold for botrytis. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so this is gray mold where you actually see this little beard of um, fuzzy gray um, spores. And, uh, um, and, and so at this point, it's quite easy to identify. The early stages, it's, it can be difficult. 
Um, and this would be even earlier stages where you first start to see small pin size, uh, pinhead size spots. You can see them on all of these petals here. On here are some petals that we've removed and put in Petri dishes uh, to see if the spots amount to anything or what they grow into. So we can put this petal in a Petri dish, seal the dish, um, may have to add some moisture to it so you have a high humidity condition. And then if, if this is Botrytis, it will continue to uh, grow and will uh, sporulate and you'll produce spores in, in, in several days. And then here are some other spots. But at, at this stage, you know, we, it's difficult, if not impossible, to say that this is Botrytis. Um, and, and so really what you need to do is, is um, um, collect tissue and, 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 and I'll show you in a moment, put it in a humid chamber to let it grow out so that you're sure that you're actually treating Botrytis. And we say this because you know, we've uh, collected a lot of roses and over the last several years and, and you see fungal growth on those roses and frequently it is not Botrytis. And yet Botrytis is the organism being blamed um, for, for this, uh, these symptoms. And so you can see, for example, uh, Alternaria, Epicoccum, uh, Penicillium, Cladosporium, all have fairly similar symptoms. And as, as the first spots appear, they're, you know, again, very difficult to separate from Botrytis. It's when they progress to more uh, further stages of development that it's more clear that these more uh, from the naked eye one could, and with some experience, start to differentiate these a bit better. And of course, in a, if you send tissue to a lab, they will plate out those spores. And then this shows you the actual spore growing in a Petri dish or under a microscope, what those spores look like. So in this situation, it's easy to um, differentiate. With experience, one can differentiate the symptoms at this more progressed stage as a spot. It's very difficult. The other thing that's worth noting is that um, not all spots are uh, fungal pathogens. One of the more common issues with um, importing roses uh, is that it is quite common for them to have these pink spots. Sometimes it's a pink fringe on the edge of the petals. Often it's a spot like this. If you remove those spots, put them in a Petri dish, we see no um, biological activity from those spots. Okay, so this is this petal actually has botrytis, but the botrytis is occurring over here. The spot was over here. Again, there's a, a pink spot over here and there's some petals here. I have many pink spots and you see no botrytis growing from those. So our conclusion is that when you do see pink pigmentation, which is pretty common on roses, these are caused by abiotic factors, meaning non-living factors. Um, not botrytis. So it's some other stress uh, or even physical damage or um, phytotoxicity from a chemical spray, perhaps. We don't know exactly what causes the spots, but it's, they're not biological. And, and so they are not botrytis. Um, and yet we will have flowers uh, often at the port of entry um, that are identified as having botrytis and be discarded at that point, or even floral customers, florists, or um, sometimes even the growers that are shipping the flowers will uh, not ship them knowing that they're going to be, this will be identified as Botrytis. And so it is important that we have um, a better understanding that, the, that these are, are really not problematic. Um, um, it will, yeah. So another symptom that we see that has a relationship to Botrytis is what we'll call bent neck in roses, and you'll see this in Gerbera daisies too, where the tissue at the base of the flower here, the top of the peduncle or the base of the receptacle is often soft. Uh, if it has been grown in a humid environment, you've had some cell elongation at the top there, and then um, Botrytis infects that tissue quite well, and then you get the, the, the stems topple over. Now, there's not, you don't always have botrytis with bent neck. You can have bent neck that is simply a physiological problem um, where a rose uh, grown in a very humid environment um, uh, 
does not regulate water use very well. And, and so when that rose is harvested, uh, put in a vase, um, there can be no botrytis, but you'll, you'll see this neck bend over because the tissue is just very soft and the, uh, the plant basically is wilting by, because it's not taking up water efficiently enough to supply that the top of the flower or the top of the flowering stem. So, but again, because that soft tissue, Botrytis does infect it, and so you will see botrytis associated with bent neck in some situations, as these pictures uh, show. Petunia symptoms, and I'd say in, in flower petals in general, we're looking at beige uh, lesions. These are uh, petunias that we have sprayed many spores on, so you're seeing many individual spots that then will coalesce into big lesions. Um, but again, it's, it's this beige, almost looks like a, a burn, a chemical burn. Um, and then as these uh, lesions coalesce and if the humidity is high, um, you will see the entire petal uh, disintegrate and, and then gray mold forming on those petals. With Gerbera daisy, it's, it's, it's a bit of a unique one. Um, we see the, the main, the most common uh, location for botrytis to infect Gerbera is in the disc florets in the center, not, the, not these ray florets uh, or the petals, um, which is what we normally see being the most infected on most other species of, of flowers. Uh, Gerbera, it's the disc florets that you'll see this botrytis uh, forming. You, it will grow into the ray floret, but it's, that's usually secondary. You will also see, just like the bent neck we showed you on uh, the roses, you will see infection occurring at the top of the peduncle or the flowering stem or at the base of the receptacle. With, with the, these would be the, the, the calyx, the calyces, um, these, the, the, basically the bud scales um, that you'll see the infection occur there quite uh, aggressively and then that, that, that flower will nod off, um, so. So I mentioned before, if, if there's questions about whether or not you have botrytis, it's the very easy way to do this is to take whatever tissue you're interested in um, looking at or finding botrytis on and put it in a humid environment. So basically trap the, the, the tissue in a plastic baggie like there's a little like Ziploc bag here, a little bit of water in the bottom, and then see if you get gray mold formation. Uh, this is one we use for whole flowering stems where you know, there's a, a, it's a four by four chamber and we uh, um, put a plastic lid over it. Here's a Tupperware situation where again, the stems are cut, put in some water in the bottom to keep them alive, also to create a human environment. This is the same thing. These are rose stems that are uh, probably 50 centimeters long, and they're in the and uh, sitting in um, water with uh, and then a, a netting here to support the flowers. And so after a, a week, if you have botrytis, it'll be clear uh, that you have botrytis because they will they'll start to uh, sporulate um, quite aggressively in three to seven days after putting the tissue in these chambers. Okay, so that's a little bit of the background with the biology and, and how you ex and, and the symptomology of botrytis. Uh, we'll talk about managing botrytis now. Um, and the, really the key in management is, is a good scouting program, finding the botrytis um, before it is, uh, has a chance to sporulate. Once botrytis produces a lot of spores, um, you know, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. So we have a little video here that will show you um, this of a, of a rose that you can see has gray mold on it. And these are the, the spores on these uh, that are on the tissue and, and we'll drop that rose and you can see the, the spores coming off of the tissue. We'll try that again. There we go. So you can see the spores just wafting off of there and you're talking about millions and millions of spores that are now out there to in infect other tissue. So what we're trying to do in scouting is get it to a point where we're um, 
getting not not allowing the tissue to get to this sporulating stage because once we've reached that it gets management becomes very difficult because it really only takes one spore to cause a lesion that ruins a petal or a leaf. So it's also important to note that different tissues have different sensitivities uh, to botrytis. So petals tend to be um, the most sensitive, I'd say most species, um, flower petals are more uh, sensitive than leaves in almost all situations. Um, part of that is because we believe, and we'll talk about this more on part three, is that you know petals do not have, they have very low levels of calcium. They only have about 10% of the calcium that a leaf would. And that calcium is important to build strong tissues. And so when you have, have a rapidly um, uh, expanding tissue like a flower petal, um, the calcium levels are very low. And, and the plant just does not have a, a strong physical resistance to that spore. Once it has germinated, that spore uh, freely penetrates the, the petal tissue and proliferates that tissue. So also on roses where we cut the stems, um, you always, almost always see some uh, necrosis below that stem where it, the stem dies back to the next bud and that tissue is also quite susceptible to botrytis. And you, know, you don't see many dead flowers in rose canopies because you know, most growers keep those out quite effectively, um, but you always have dead stems. And so for me, when we're looking at cut flower roses, this is the easiest place to find uh, spores uh, being produced. Um, but try to spores being produced. If we're scouting, to me, that this is the easiest place to find it. Leaves will sh also um, get botrytis, as you can see here, um, but they're quite a bit more resistant. Again, they have 10 times the calcium concentration as petals. Um, so usually the, the leaf has to be damaged or have fallen off the plant um, to really be highly susceptible to botrytis. Um, uh, uh, nice whole intact leaves on healthy plants tend to be much less sensitive. Um, maybe an exception to that would be something like poinsettia uh, in propagation. You know, we've harvested a cutting, it's been shipped uh, around the world in a box for a few days, and then it goes into a very humid, wet propagation environment. Um, and, and, those, and the leaves can be attacked by botrytis pretty aggressively even if they're not wounded. If they're wounded, it certainly enters, uh, uh, the botrytis will infect that tissue more aggressively, but even intact poinsettia leaves and propagation can be a, a bit of a challenge to uh, prevent botrytis. Also, when we're scouting plants, it's not just on the plants, but the environment surrounding the plants. So, you know, we, we have to be really aware of, for some reason, roses that have broken off in the harvesting or whatever that have fallen on the floor can become huge sources of inoculum. Uh, we have a lot of leaf debris and in, in some uh, cut flower crops in particular. Bedding plants, when you have a tight flat of um, bedding plants, you know, the lower leaves um, get crowded out quite a bit. They um, don't get a lot of direct sunlight. They become weak and, and they're right on near the soil surface. And, and so really a good human environment for botrytis to grow. And, and so, you know, tight canopies within the bedding plant uh, canopy is also, also quite susceptible. And then also you should be aware of um, um, botrytis can also grow um, from what's called uh, sclerotia, which are kind of hardened mycelia. So it's kind of like this, this root stem structure of a fungus that is um, it's 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 um, uh, it's it's a, a uh, what I want to say a uh, a structure that allows it to um, survive a very harsh environments, um, perhaps like overwintering, and so you know the, this this sclerotia um, can um, um, allow the plant to survive over a long period of time. So it's kind of goes into a dormant state. And so you can have sclerotia on stems or in the soil. Um, and so 
uh, but that can also be a source of inoculum on uh, plants that you're growing long term. It's not going to be an issue on bedding plants or annuals, but uh, woodier plants or multiple season plants like the cuffflower roses, it, it could be more significant. So again, you have different sensitivities here. You say the flowers being highly susceptible, the leaves are susceptible as well as uh, stems and in the soil that can occur. It's also worth noting that um, spores are going to land on tissues as they develop, uh, go through different stages of development. And so you will see differ, differing locations of symptoms appearing depending on where and when those spores landed. So we have a little example here where we have, this is our botrytis spore that's floating around and we've got a rose from a pea-sized bud up until um, one that's ready to be harvested where it's, it is starting to uh, unfurl and open up the petals. And so if this botrytis spore lands on the back side of this bud um, at this point, um, then you can later have infections on that um, calyx um, later uh, in, in the, in the post-harvest environment, for example where the tissue has, again, initially a small infection occurs, the spore has germinated, but it hasn't caused any uh, visible necrotic spots, but it is a latent infection that, that will appear on this tissue at a later date. Similarly, you have a, this is the, the top of the peduncle or the base of the flower, is tends to be fairly soft tissue um, and, and is, can be infected at this point and then you see uh, bent neck occurring later on uh, and botrytis affecting the base of that flower petal. You have at this stage, the outer petals of the flower are, are uh, exposed. And so the spore can land on that outer petal. And then you see an infection on the outer petal at a later date. Or just in the last couple of days before that flower is harvested, it is just starting to open up and you have a spore land on one of the inner petals that then appears um, um, in the post-harvest um, or consumer, yeah, you know, post-harvest shipping environment on that inner petal. Now that inner petal is not going to possibly be infected at these earlier dates because it's not exposed. Um, the spore is not going to land on, let's just say here, on the outer side of this bud and then grow into an inner petal without also having infected the, the, um, the outer part of the bud, the calyx here, and the outer petals. So the spore doesn't land, germinate, go through a few layers of tissue and then infect a, a petal that's on the inside. When you have petals that are infected on the inside of a flower, that spore has landed on those petals um, after they have been exposed. So, this is just a slide to show you, just to reiterate that point, where we have different stages of flower bud development, where they're immature, flowers changing color, as the previous picture showed. And then we go through processing, packaging, storage, shipment, uh, and then to the retail environment. And you know the exposure of those, those tissues to spores will vary. We have put in spore traps in um, packing houses and in coolers where cut flowers are harvested. And, and we have marked here low, low probability of spores landing because we count very, very few spores uh, in those environments. Because um, in a cooler or in a packing house, you don't have tissue that's sporulating, right? It's, it's usually, it's going to be in the greenhouse where there's decaying tissue that has produced spores that are then floating around. So when we're talking about botrytis, we're usually looking at infections that are occurring during um, production that then are being expressed in the post-harvest environment. We really are not hugely concerned about spores uh, infecting plants once they've been, um, once, they've, once the flowers have gotten to the uh, packing house. Um, and, and so again, the, 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 pro the probability of disease development actually becomes higher as you're later in the process um, where you have a high, humid envir high humidity environment um, during storage and shipment. So you 
if those same flowers had stayed maybe in the greenhouse um, where it's a bit drier, you may not have seen much symptom, symptom development, but once they're packaged in the boxes and the humidity gets very high in the boxes, then your, your chance of expressing that fungus, fungi, the fungus uh, growing uh, and proliferating the tissue is going to increase. So again, this is what I was trying to show before. You have an inner petal here um, that has only been exposed after that flower is open. So there's no way for that petal to become infected um, until that tissue is exposed. And so, and we see this with roses a lot that the outer petals are often not the most um, likely to have uh, become infected because we are spraying fungicides and they're frequently hitting the outer petals as that bud is developing. But in those last few days, we don't necessarily have a, a the fungicide is not hitting these inner petals as that flower is opening up on an, you know, every hour, it's changing um, and, and the surfaces are becoming exposed. And so, you know, it's spores landing on this petal just before it's being harvested. And, um, and, and, and that petal is not being protected by uh, fungicides or something like calcium because it's just been exposed. Outer petals may have plenty of fungicide on to prevent um, spores from germinating, but inner petals can be pretty sensitive. So the timing um, of protecting tissue is, is, is kind of critical and because flowers are always changing and new surfaces are being um, exposed to the spores that are in the surrounding air. It's important to note that the, the environmental conditions um, for Botrytis um, are, are uh, well, well, we'll show you what they are in just a moment, but we can monitor the weather, the, the climate in a greenhouse, and, and we can actually predict with you know, a degree of um, accuracy uh, when Botrytis is likely to infect plants. And so in this example, we have a weather station this is called a leaf wetness sensor, and these come in different, different way, different type. There are different types of leaf wetness sensors. This one has a piece of tissue paper, and as uh, and two electrodes here. And as that tissue becomes wetted, the electrical current across the tissue changes, and so you can measure how long or when that paper is wet and how long it's been wet. And then you can also measure temperature and humidity, and and we do this because. I guess this is my one um, graph is this is our model to predict botrytis infection. And if we're trying to predict when botrytis will be a problem, we're looking at a couple factors is how long the leaf is wet, how many hour, continuous hours the leaf is wet or whatever tissue you're looking at, the petals. Um, or the leaf doesn't have to be wet if the environment is over 93% humidity, relative humidity. So it's the duration of leaf wetness or really high relative humidity um, by temperature. And so this graph shows you the inf inf infection risk. So being really risky to no risk as a function of temperature and then the number of hours of continuous leaf wetness. So the blue line is 12 hours. And so as you go from this is 50 Fahrenheit up to 68 Fahrenheit and down to 86 Fahrenheit, you know, so we're at a, you know, almost a risk of say 35% if the leaf has been wet for 12 hours and the temperatures have been at, in the mid to high 60s. As we are, the longer we are wet, um, the higher the probability that a spore will germinate and infect tissue. So we have about a hundred percent chance of infection if uh, our temperatures are again about 68, anywhere from you know 60 to 75. It's pretty good, and and that leaf has been wet for 24 hours. So this is why it's important for plants to stay dry or to stay humid, or excuse me, this to be in a drier environment, uh, low relative humidity, and and that reduces your risk of botrytis significantly. So these data are based on what's called the Strawberry Advisory System which is a system developed for strawberries. Um, and, um, and it's used to help strawberry farmers anticipate when would be the best time to apply a fungicide. Um, and so we've played with this just a little bit. 
and it is going to show you the data just just because I think it's interesting. Um, this is just a, a couple week, three week period of time in January, February. And um, what I really want to show you is the blue line is the number of hours of continuous leaf wetness in this particular greenhouse. So you can see the blue line matches up with the numbers on the right side. We have over 16 hours of continuous leaf wetness every single night for the, the three weeks of this experiment. And, and, in, and in the, this, this is about a, a seven day period of time here um, where every night um, the, or every day the plants were wet for 24 continuous hours. So really you had five, six days here in a row with continual leaf wetness. You know, so, so you're now, uh, yeah. And, and so your risk of infection is very, very high. Over here, the calculated risk for these same 14 or 21 days. And you can see there's quite a number of the days where we're over 50% risk. This is simply to show you that um, risk can be anticipated based on the environment. And that in a greenhouse environment, we can have a lot of days during cloudy, cool weather conditions, especially um, when the plants are at a very, very high risk of infection. That's all you need to know there. So one of the ways we can address that issue is with air movement. And the, the preferred way to move air in the greenhouse is with horizontal airflow fans. And so what we do is we mount these above the canopy and they draw air out of that canopy. Because in this greenhouse, what you're going to have is a very humid canopy and then drier air up above. It's drier um, because it's typically warmer up there. And um, of course, it's the leaves that are transpiring to create a humid environment. So this is a little schematic to show you how, help you visualize how this works. So these are our plants. And then we have fans blowing not into the canopy and not on the canopy, but over the canopy. And as you draw, push air across the surface like this, you will draw air movement up and out of that canopy. So you're taking the moist air in the canopy and stirring it and mixing it with the dryer air above. And then of course, if you have exhaust fans, you open up the greenhouse and push out the, the uh, exhaust, the, the moist air and dry in drier air and repeat the cycle. So horizontal airflow fans can help quite a bit. Um, so I'm gonna also now describe how um, leaves become wet. Um, so you have an appreciation of the physical process here. So this is our leaf this is our, 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 uh, our body of air that is at 75% humidity. And so these, the green dots represent moisture in the air. And, and if you take a balloon and have put hot air in it, and then you let, and you fill up that balloon, and then you let that balloon get cooler, what happens is that balloon shrinks. And the same thing happens with air, essentially, when it gets cooler, its ability to hold moisture um, uh, changes and, and it becomes less. So cool air, so we're taking the same amount of water in this environment, and when we reduce the air temperature, now those particles are having to be closer together in that air. And so now we have a situation that we have, again, it's actually the same amount of moisture in the air, but it's, it's now 100% relative humidity. And then if we go just a little bit cooler, what happens is that air cannot hold any more water. It's saturated at 100%. So the only option is for the water to condense out of that air and to, and to uh, land on uh, surrounding surfaces. So we have 100% relative humidity, but when we get below what we call the dew point, it's the temperature at which you you um, hit 100% relative humidity and dew or condensation starts to form, then you have condensation on this tissue. So if you have cool greenhouses at night, you're, you're again, there's a lot of humidity produced during the day from the plants. And then at night that humidity condenses on the foliage um, because the, the temperature is dropping. So heating a greenhouse at night um, is a way to, um, maintain a higher, excuse me, a lower relative humidity and, and reduce the amount of uh, 
uh, condensation that will occur. So our take home messages then. One, diagnosing symptoms. Um, early diagnosis, early detection is important. Um, or being able to differentiate the, the symptoms from other pathogens. So uh, at the earliest stages of infection, botrytis cannot easily be distinguished, as we mentioned, from other fungal pathogens and abiotic sources. But by placing the tissue into humid chambers, the fungus will grow rapidly, produce spores, and be more easily identified within a week. So scouting, our goal is early detection and identifying where and when the infections are occurring uh, so that we're preventing sporulation in the greenhouse as much as possible. And we need to reduce the amount of inoculum that is available for spore formation and dispersal, either by removing infected tissue or preventing the tissue from becoming infected. And we can do that by following good sanitation procedures, removing debris, um, repair leaking irrigation systems so that you're removing humidity from the facility, um, not allowing the floors to be wet, um, trying to maintain a drier environment. And then we can change the environmental conditions that allow for spores to germinate. Um, by, we remove humidity from the canopy with horizontal airflow fans, and we try to keep air temperatures above the dew point uh, where we have heated greenhouses uh, so that condensation does not form. So in the next two parts, then we'll go into protecting tissues um, with the use of uh, fungicides and how to maintain um, effectiveness of the fungicides with, um, um, uh, by, by managing disease, uh, excuse me, fungicide resistance, and, and then the use of calcium to help protect tissues um, once if we have a favorable environment for botrytis formation. Additional findings from all of AFE's research can be found online at www.endowment.org. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. Research and research findings like those presented today are possible only through industry support and contributions. Thanks to generous donors, AFE can provide research solutions free to support a stronger industry. Consider making a tax-deductible contribution to support the future of the floral industry. Visit endowment.org today and check back often for new sessions and updates.